So I'm most concerned in album work, this is what we focus on, at focusing on those internal qualities and then trusting that they lead, in fact, to finished work being of higher quality. So I would rather that we focus mostly on how we are growing, thinking of the kind of skills. That's the mastery part he's talking about. But then also ideals, which is self-mastery, and then bonds with others, which is the whole purpose of mastery, is to eventually be able to have better bonds with others in your life. Before we get started, if you enjoy these episodes, you might want to check out more at OptimWork.com. Our website offers unique content, tools, and exercises to help you thrive at work and beyond. We have an in-depth masterclass covering our entire theory of growth, daily recommendations for personalized advice, and a platform to help groups and organizations learn and practice optimal work together. You can get a free trial at optimwork.com. Now let's start the episode. Hey, this is Sharif here with another episode of the Optimal Work Podcast, joined by Dr. Kevin Majors. Kevin, good to be back here with you again. Hey, Sharif, great to be back. Yeah, Kevin, uh, you're always welcome back on the show. Uh, so, oh, thanks. Uh, so, well, I thought we could cover today Cal Newport's low productivity, the lost art of productivity without burnout. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so this is, uh, yeah, I think it's always interesting to see the work that he's doing. We've covered uh, deep work on a previous podcast. Uh, I always recommend to people his book, How to Become a Straight A Student. Uh, how to mm -hmm. become a straight A student for for college students. I think he has another one for high schoolers that I haven't gotten into mm -hmm. yet. Um, but so it's always interesting to explore how he's thinking of things and the overlap with how we approach things. Yeah, it is interesting. And there's been a, pro a progression in how he approaches his books. He started by working directly with a whole bunch of individual super achievers in college. And he may have, I think, I don't know if he was in college himself or maybe he was in grad school when he started doing that. See, so and he, by interviewing all of these college superstars, he found out what were their, what did they have in common? Like, what were the habits that they mentioned again and again? And he wrote a book about it. I think his later books then moved more into like thinking about what did the studies show? What does science show about how to focus, how to work? And then now it's more looking at stories from the lives of people in the past to see what can we learn from their way of working to see for modern knowledge workers to see how they can improve their productivity? So in a way, that's like an overview, I think, of Cal Newport's approach. Mm -hmm. what, what would you say are the big themes of his work in terms of like, so good they can't ignore you, deep work, mm -hmm. uh, digital minimalism? It seems to me that um, one of the driving themes here is that you know, a really fulfilling career is about mm -hmm. getting very good at what you do. So it's all about mastering your craft and that kind of all of these other strategies he recommends, deep work um, and some of the pro uh, digital minimalism, a world, mm -hmm. world without email, he says all of these other things distract you from perfecting your craft. And so you kind of need to say no to a lot of things, push a lot of things out, make time for deep work so that you can uh have a and and a lot of those themes come back here in this book i think um but i, I don't know if that's a, an accurate assessment or you'd agree with that i think that's exactly right he's very focused on mastery and it's wonderful to read him if you want to be reflecting on your professional life and thinking what would it look like for me to aim for higher quality in my work and how can I think about the quality of my output? So, and I think that's very much Cal Newport's focus. It's always on what are you producing? Is it of high quality? Is it a kind of legacy building artifact? Which is a kind of phrase he uses here in this book that to be thinking of what is it the things that you're doing and are they worthwhile? So as far as it goes, looking for quality in your work to be and to raise it to the highest level. I think it's a, you know, his, his yearly books are like, or every other year are, are a great reminder to be pursuing that level of quality and to be thinking about, and maybe that's one of the big takeaways from this book too, is become more a student of quality. 
Develop your ability to have good taste. And what does quality work really look like? And then maybe it's like looking outside of your field, but find what ways you can emulate the producers of really great quality work and think about raising the quality of your own. I think it's a wonderful message. Yeah. And it's and then it seems like another theme that, and this one I think has deep resonance with Optum Work, is a focus on the, the person's process, your process of working mm -hmm. and the strategies that, that you use. So he's always, it seems, coming out with new ideas for how to organize your day, how to organize your task list, you know, how, mm -hmm. so he's always thinking about the process of how you go about working, which I think mm -hmm. is very similar to our approach. He's not, he's, he's an expert in his field, um, but he's not an expert in everyone's field. And I think he understands that, but he's trying to draw yeah. out what's, what's kind of common to all these. And I, I think that's, there's a nice fit there with the way we think about it as well. I think so. And he, he doesn't discuss things like threat mode and, and anxiety, but he is trying to address burnout. And why is it that people have a way of working that isn't working for them? They're left constantly busy and feeling like they always have to be visibly doing things. And this is his concept of pseudo productivity, but it's basically looking busy all the time. And that in many jobs, that is still passable. That as long as people think you're constantly doing stuff and busy and rushing, then uh, it's like maybe then you're safe, but you're miserable. And so I think his idea is why don't we try to look more at why is it that we keep working in such a way that we're just at the edge of sustainable? So, with, so people are constantly, constantly feeling overtaxed by the amount of things that they have to do and the amount of asynchronous communicating they have to do. So there's kind of, there's so much email back and forth and Slack channels and other, other asynchronous forms of communication that, um, so there's this idea, there's like an overhead tax that if you're gonna work on a project, then uh, he gives the example, what is it like, say you're writing a report, this can take seven hours, but you know that that report will also require one hour of overhead, that the kind of, emails and other you know, phone you know, conversations you have to have to deal with, to do it well. Well, that's an eight hour day. And then you could do one of those a day. But if you have four of those and each of those requires an hour of overhead, it's like you cut your productivity in half. So he's looking at people whose schedules are filled with overhead. They're constantly having to communicate with others and attend meetings and give status reports that they have very little time to actually do their work. And that, and that that's where they start to basically say no more and they push back. But what the result is that they're constantly then stuck at this total level of overwhelm that's just unrelenting. And he says the, the way you fix that is you have to start saying no much earlier in the process. You have to start spacing projects as much as you can. We can talk about how he talks about missions and projects and things like that and daily goals. But you have to be spacing things out so the overhead isn't taking up a disproportionate amount of time. Mm -hmm. So uh, the book is focused on three principles. Mm -hmm. uh, so in this uh, slow productivity, so this is getting into the first one, which is do fewer things. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, se the second being work at a natural pace. Uh, and then the third is to, what, what's the third again, Kevin? I Obsess over quality. Uh, co quality, quality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which we already talked about. Yeah. Um, yeah. I always, I always have trouble listing out things of three. And just, a, and just people might have trouble with the word obsess as well. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. he's not saying have perfectionism. He's not saying develop OCD. He's just saying you do want to be constantly concerned about the quality of your work. And you're trying to do fewer things, but to do them very well while working on them at a natural pace. So I think doing fewer things is where people will have the hardest time because you have to say no earlier than I'm so stressed out. Like if I say yes to this, I won't be able to sleep. So that you have to start saying no as much as you can earlier. Sometimes I like to say we have to, we have to emulate the courage of the quiet quitter. <laughs> Try to 
try to quietly quit within the context of your ordinary work. But don't go, you know, to zero percent. Go to eighty percent. What would it look like to cut back, maybe seventy five percent? So he's, he suggests like try to cut back as much as you can on on whatever is not absolutely required. Start saying no much earlier. Develop a quota system. Like there are this many. I don't know, he, in his life, it's uh, doing um, reviewing articles. It's part of the peer review process that you need experts to review other people's articles. And he says, okay, he has a certain number of those he'll do per semester. And once he's reached that quota, he says to everyone, I, you know, I love doing this reviewing, but I just, I've reached my quota for this semester. And he says, no one comes back and argues with you about your quota. So you can say, look, I'm, I love doing these kind of activities. I love helping out in this way. But right now, I, like, I've reached the quota for how many I can do at a time. And people don't actually argue with that. So he's, I, lo I love this idea. Just respond clearly and quickly to people so that they can move on and ask someone else. And if you, you don't just say you're busy because that's everyone's busy and you no know, one, you can't use that. People can argue well. People argue with just saying I'm busy. But you just say, this, I have these, like, this many things right now on my plate so that I wouldn't be able to accept it until maybe next week. You find ways to control the process of what work comes to you. Anyway, so doing fewer things is all, the, is all that's the umbrella of it. Before we continue, a brief message. If you're benefiting from these discussions, please take a moment to hit like and subscribe. Doing so helps us to reach more people. So you're not just learning, you're also helping others to discover a path of growth and flourishing. Thanks for your support. Yeah, I... I definitely like the point that people can get stuck in a vicious cycle where mm -hmm. they feel like there's a lot of things they're not doing everything that they need to so they kind of add more to their to-do list to their you know list of active projects but then that just creates more overhead so it makes them get less done so then they mm -hmm. feel even more overwhelmed so there's kind of some problems with that um i guess yeah one thing that strikes me as you know he, what he's talking about it doesn't seem like people have deadlines or is he's not really grappling with that fact as much that so i think some people you know just feel like well i just have to get i just have to do these things by this time or you know my boss is going to get mad and i'm going to get fired so um so how does how does that in your mind factor into this thing of do fewer things I think doing fewer th things means within the limits of your current job. So whatever you can say no to or delay, then you, then you do that. It's just certainly true that in some jobs you don't have the same flexibility. But he, his experience has been, and I guess this is primarily through people who he communicates with through his, the feedback he gets from books and maybe workshops, but also from his website that he has a sense of what people, that he pushes people on this a lot. You just, you have to try to say no, because in fact, everyone does say no when they're at the point of total burnout and unsustainable busyness. So he's saying, we have to start being able to say no before that point. So maybe one thing people can do is try to just get used to saying no. Try to get used to like having things in the, to the extent that you can don't just let everything go immediately onto your plate that now you just work on it, but let the person, maybe there's someone assigning you things to do, let them know what you're capable of. Let them know what other deadlines you have <clears throat> so that they can make a decision about how important this is. But doing fewer things really, in my mind, comes down to living order, the ideal of order, which does mean prioritizing how many things are truly important and, and then pr trying to be narrowing down that number. He says that you, he talks about having a mission in your professional work and that you can basically have two or three missions. So his is to write quality books and do quality like academic work in his, in his role as a professor at Georgetown. Okay, well that's, so those are two main missions that he has. Uh, and then, well, he adds on a podcast and there's some other things. So that's like maybe three. Okay, I think that, that sometimes people have enough flexibility that they can say that right now this is the main thing I'm doing, or these two main things. And then he says, within them, you're going to have projects. And a project, he defines just like we do in optimal work, 
It's basically a task that will take more than one hour or more than one sitting to, to be able to do. And he says that you should basically have one of those a day. So try to just have one important thing a day. So if I would be, um, I don't know, writing the anxiety class, then I wouldn't at this, on that same day be, I guess, preparing a podcast and recording a podcast. Um, now I have to say that I actually think as long as you, have, to me, it's way more important to have rhythms, which kind of gets into the next point, you know, than to say just arbitrarily limit the number of things you work on in a given day to just one one main project. Right. That's what, and I was going to ask, does that mean after we're finished recording that I should take the day off? <laughs> yeah, probably sure. If you need you 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 need time off. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. the second thing they talks about of working at a natural pace, uh, that might that's that's arguably more important, I think, because if your pace is sustainable, well, that kind of that's that deals with the issue of are you doing too many things or not? Are you doing too many things in a day? For me, I found that I have like a really great pace switching between my work, seeing patients and doing mentoring, coaching, and then teaching in the med school, and then, you know, writing things like the anxiety class and then doing podcasts. So I have a very nice, you know, kind of rhythm I have for how I go about. And that makes it so much easier to get more accomplished. I love being able to work in little bits of time on different things. Now, by little bits, it might be 45 minutes or an hour, trying to advance things bit by bit. Uh, I noticed when I was doing the anxiety class, looking back on the versions in Google Doc, the, the, it was impossible because I think that there are so many things I did and the little bits here and there as I was working on things that you end up with like, 1700 versions of, of, of a document and it's just impossible to be scrolling through um anyway my point is that i think that if you have a really sustainable rhythm a kind of pace that is intense but with breaks uh he talks about breaks at the big level like maybe take a month or two off a year if your work life allows for that he's a college professor so his does um and he also talks about the importance of keeping like taking a day off a week. So in, in a number of his books, he's mentioned the importance of having a total day off a week, at, at least one. He doesn't talk so much about working in sprints and breaks. So, but I think that for a natural pace of work, that's actually the, the essential thing. To work as full intensity as you can, and then to take a total break for 10 to 15 minutes. And there's a neuroscience behind this, ultradian rhythms, that we can work for about 90 minutes on something. And that's as long as an ultradian rhythm goes. Maybe in some cases it can go a bit longer, but that's the average. And then you need a total break. Otherwise, the capacity to do intellectual work drops. After 10 or 15 minutes, you come back and you can do another up to 90 minutes. Shorter is okay, but longer is worse. And then take a break. I think that sense of working in sprints and breaks, you can use breaks to switch between locations so that there's a natural buffering between different types of activities. I think that that all fits together with his idea of pacing. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing that I don't think we talk about much, he, he talks about the seasonal, like, uh, I forget, does he use the example of farmers or like, you, you know, you have a season where you're sowing seeds and then yeah i think it's george o'keefe was his example for that <laughs> oh okay i mean yeah so you you know you're sowing the seeds and then you're harvesting yeah. and then and then it's winter and you can't really do any work yeah. you know in, on the farm during that time so he thinks it's kind of like built into our nature or, or our psychology that we would have these seasons of high productivity and then high output and then basically rest and waiting to kind of get back to work so and and then he gives the example, I think, of Basecamp, which is a software company, um, possibly a, a competitor to Optimal Work, but that's okay. Uh, and uh, and they would work in their software engineers would work in six to eight week intense sprints, and mm -hmm. then take two weeks to then kind of plan the next. So it's kind of a similar idea to two weeks then mm -hmm. to plan and reflect and work on smaller projects. So you just get this sense of how important is is that to you. Uh, Kevin, I don't know. Is there any 
the scientific research into that, that having these rhythms over the course of, of weeks or months or years is important. I haven't seen any anything on the topic of like seasonality per se as a concept. So, but that people like be able to have longer breaks, again, this might not be something that's easy to research because breaks are so variable. Like what, what are you doing in a break? It's, it's also unique to each person. Absolutely though, I believe that you do need time off. So there are people that I work with who haven't had vacations in years. It might've been five years since their last vacation. And to me, that it would be totally unsustainable. So, you know, you and I are both able to take off time in the summer. So there's, we go for time, we're not doing podcast recording. You know, and there's a little bit, I think there, there, we still keep up with some things, you know, we, you make sure that the website's running and all. Uh, but at the same time, it's, it's, it is less intense. So I think that it's actually crucial that people have if not seasons, then at least there's regular breaks. Yeah. And I, Kevin, I, I love work, don't get me wrong, but it is a little disheartening when, you know, you, you have this big project and then you're working on it intensely for weeks and weeks and weeks, and then you finally launch it. And then it's like the next day, it's another big, you start another big project. Yeah. And it's like, well, come on, like, what am I doing here? I mean, I, yeah, that's can right. Can I enjoy what I've done or, you know, like I would think of, you know, an art, a sculpture, making a statue, you know, after he makes it, you might want to like look at it and <laughs> take some time. Exactly. <laughs> Delight in the work that he's created instead of like ex immediately going to starting to create the next statue. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I think that like when I finished the anxiety class, that was something I worked on very intensely for about seven months. And it was always in some sense on in my default mode network. You know, making testing things in my mind, testing how I say things with patients and stuff, and making sure that I get this good resonance on every every concept. And then once so that whole process, I would have appreciated hearing Cal Newport's advice because he said, if you're doing a big project like that and you're trying to work at a natural pace, double the amount of time you think it's going to take. And that actually would have been exactly right for the anxiety class because I was thinking that. We'd be done by maybe mid-December or something. And but by then I was not nearly and but I still had a sense that not to rush things, to like let things gestate. And then I wouldn't work on it for like a period of like five days, maybe, and then come back to it. And, and then put in more time and then step aside again and then come back to it. Now, I had no deadline. You weren't really you were very kind about the whole thing, Sharif. You weren't you weren't you weren't being demanding of a certain you know, get this done by now. Um, and so that helped that I, I didn't feel pressured, except just internally that I wanted to. And then when I finally finished it, it felt like it had taken the right amount of time and it was about twice as long. Anyway, but he does mention when you're doing that kind of intellectual work, producing these artifacts, these generational legacy artifacts, then, uh, then just double the amount of time you think it's going to take. And that I think that leads naturally into his third point, which is obsess over quality or focus over quality. Um, and I, I guess one, one thing we often tell people is to set a deadline because mm -hmm. work will expand to fit the amount of time that you give it. I think that's Parkinson's law. Exactly. Uh, yeah. But but uh, for you, it was very helpful to say, well, I'm going to get this right and I'll take the time that I need. So if you had said, well, after three months, I'm just going to turn in what I have. I mean, oh, that, I don't think yeah. that would have worked. So mm -hmm. uh, so how do you help people kind of balance that or be flexible that, yeah, you want to keep up a, a demanding pace, um, but also you want to, you know, be, you want it to be ready. You want it to be really done mm -hmm. when you finish. And especially with some of these projects, knowledge work, you're going to run into things that you couldn't have anticipated and that's going to add to the amount of time it takes. I guess, I suppose that's why you kind of you double what you think. Exactly. Uh, but so, so how do you help people approach that? There's, and there's no simple answer, I think, to it. I mean, in some ways you think about um, what would it be like to be overly focused on quality? Well, it would bring total paralysis. So you have to, you have to stop just short of that. <laughs> that's kind of essentially what people... 
you know, uh, you know, recommend so that while taking quality seriously, you realize that things may need to be iterated and that many great works didn't appear all at once, but that, that, so in some ways, um, because that also helped me while, uh, while making the anxiety class, knowing that there is going to be a process back and forth that I would love for this class to be something that I don't know that we could invest 15 million into producing the perfect one. So this is like V1, but at least the ideas are mature and solid and coherent and elegantly unite so that they're all, it all fits together. And then how we actually explain things, how things get worded, what kind of now we're working on, you know, how do we um, do the graphics to make it appealing and to increase people's ability to take in what, you know, the learning. Okay. Well, all of that then is going to be iterative. So there, I think many, a lot of work does in fact have this iterative quality open to it that you can keep coming back and making it better. Certainly you're working like in the website itself is iterative that we're always kind of iterating on it. Right. Yeah. On the other hand, I guess if you're, he, Cal likes to use the example of, you know, from natural things, a farmer, you know, mm -hmm. he's got a deadline when he has to get the crops in or, but I don't yeah. know, before some natural event or before everyone starts starving. So you can't exactly, uh, you can't delay those events. You got to finish by that time. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe that's, that's one of the differences between knowledge work and uh, those, those types of activities. Um, I guess, you know, you know, one thing in this gets a little bit uh, back to our, what we were talking about before in, in natural rhythms that it's nice to have after you complete a big project it's nice to kind of take a break have almost a sabbatical or something um just to rest um recharge but i i guess one of the concerns i would have with this intense this uh focus on productivity is that you start to think that well the rest is for the sake of more productivity as opposed mm -hmm. to okay, what is really the point of my work? And I think this is where at Optum Work we talk about ideals, ideals of especially love and service in the context of work, um, deepening mm -hmm. bonds with other people. And it seems to me that, that that what he's saying is compatible with that, but he doesn't as much talk about it. So I, I'm trying to get your thoughts of how ideals and bonds and service ties into slow productivity. Maybe it's re worth reviewing the distinction of the two kinds of goods that come from any kind of work. One good is transitive and the other is intransitive. So transitive goods are what Cal Newport's talking about. It's the quality of the finished product, the, the uh, artifact that you end up making. So, and that's only what he's focused on is what does it take to produce this high quality output? Now that transitive good is actually an outcome. It's an outcome that's in the finished thing. And I am more concerned because I think in fact, it's more motivating to be looking at the intransitive goods, which is the quality in the person who does the finishing. So by putting uh, attentiveness into the finished product, you become more attentive. And that attentiveness could then be even lived in the context that are higher. So it could apply to the bonds that you have with others. So there is quality of attentiveness, let's say, that's united. It's one thing in the finished product, that's the transitive attentiveness. And it's another in the person themselves, that's the intransitive. It's intransitive because it doesn't pass out of you. It stays within you. So I'm most concerned in Alpha work, this is what we focus on, at focusing on those internal qualities and then trusting that they lead, in fact, to finished work being of higher quality. So I would rather that we focus mostly on how we are growing, thinking of the kind of skills. That's the mastery part he's talking about. But then also ideals, which is self-mastery, and then bonds with others, which is the whole purpose of mastery, is to eventually be able to have better bonds with others in your life. So all of I think there's this kind of vertical directionality that I'm most interested in. 
Uh, but it's served by this kind of horizontal level of just looking at what the finished product is like. But if you only focus on the finished product, it doesn't answer the question why to do it. Why be productive? Yeah. And just the very concept of productivity, it means you're talking about the product, the outcome. So that's, an, that's a limitation inherent, not in Cal Newport, but in the concept of productivity, that it ends up with this focus on the done deed, the finish act, rather than what are the kind of ideals that lead us to do this. That's great. Well, Kevin, uh, I just have one last question for you. That was Go for it. That was a great note. We could have ended on that one, but uh, one more. Uh, which is you're, you're mentioning before we started recording that uh, there was a, a very nice tie-in with his three principles, do fewer things, set a natural, work at a natural pace, and then obsess over quality um, with uh, three things that we often talk about, order, intensity, and constancy in work. And yeah. I've just found, I've found in recently talking to people that order, intensity, constancy really helps organize a, a conversation around how you're working well. Um, so yeah. I don't know if you could just make that explicit um, right here of how those tie in, tie together. So I think that order, intensity, and constancy are how we use work to grow internally. So, and it's, and it, so we put order into our work, but we become more ordered as we do it. When you take the big, all the things you have to do, you put a priority in them so you can set the right goal for this time of work and break that down into steps. So I see order is about doing fewer things overall, but also means that right now you break down what you're about to do into a few things and then do them in the right order. Intensity then is how you put the, it's how you apply your whole intelligence, your whole attention to then now doing this work right now. And that's what makes us more capable of actually giving our attention to others as well. So in intensity is this capacity to deploy your whole attention to a chosen object. So in work, that makes you unitask. Just do this one thing now, do this one step with all of your attention in it. But in relationships, that's actually the same exact quality that makes us capable of forgetting ourselves and attending to the people we're with. It's the ability to fully deploy your attention. And constancy is finishing until, like, when the goal is attained. Seeing the task through. And this is where he's talking about obsessing over quality. You know, but this capacity to be committed, once you've committed yourself to a task, to see it through until it's perfectly completed. Again, perfectly, not to become a perfectionist, but to put care and love into how you do it. So, in fact, by becoming, like, good workers, able to work with order, intensity, constancy, we actually become capable of living at our best. We can, we can prioritize, we can deploy our attention as needed, and then we can be committed and faithful to our job but, and to each individual task, but more broadly to the ideals and bonds we have in life. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, Kevin. Well, I think that's a great note for us to end on here, actually. All right, Sharif. There you go. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Evan. We'll be back next week. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. If you enjoyed our conversation and you're looking for more in-depth guidance, check out OptimalWork.com, our unique platform that delivers content, tools, and exercises to help you thrive at work and beyond.